Uh, good morning and welcome to Agape. Uh, would you please stand and uh, greet people next to you? Please stay standing for worship.
You gonna be reading a verse? It's coming. Yeah. Uh, okay, there it is. Um, so the Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raising up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due, se in due season. You open your hands, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears the city and saves them. And in this verse, we could see how great our God is and how wonderful he is. And through it all, we just know that he's going to be the one that remains in the end. So let us sing, One Thing Remains. invite Philip up for our five-minute message. Good morning, everybody. I uh, hope, you're, hope you're having a good weekend so far and a good morning. Uh, all right, so since my semester just started this last week at school, I uh, decided to spend some my last chance of free time yesterday. I went to my local uh, my shop or my lab that I go to work on projects at. And I uh, spent, the spent the day there working on a project. And uh, so I was there, I started thinking to myself, <clears throat> I started thinking about the church. And uh, 
started thinking about like what is it like why do I love the church you know why do I come to church and uh, so a few things that popped in my head of course the first one was the worship you know like I love coming to the church and hearing the worship uh, the next one was the fellowship coming here and getting to see all my friends and uh, everyone in our community and then of course glorifying the Lord uh, and then also Jesus you know the fact that Jesus loved the church so uh, basically that you know, my message just came to me yesterday as I was working. So, uh, my message today, it's a short one, just a few topics of why we love the church and why we go to church. So, I uh, did a little Google search you know, this morning. I was trying to come up with some, uh, some good verses and stuff for this message. So, the first one I came up with is, uh, of course, Jesus loved the church. In, in Ephesians 5, 25, and 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and balanced. So that's my first reason uh, why we should love the church because you know, right there uh, in scripture, Jesus tells us to love the church. So. Uh, my second point is to glorify God. So in 1 Corinthians it says 10.31, or in 1 Corinthians 10.31 it says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of the Lord. And so uh, that's something that not only do we do it at church, but we should try to do it every day, right? you know, whether we're at school or at work, you know, in a meeting, uh, we should always be trying to glorify the Lord. And you know, for me, that's a difficult, uh, difficult one. Uh, maybe in the morning I can be glorifying the Lord, and I get to school, and I get a bad grade on an assignment, and you know, not glorifying the Lord for the next hour or two. But uh, that's something that we always need to be working on. You know, whether whether we are eating or or whatever we're doing, always be glorifying the Lord. And then uh, my third point is it unifies the body of Christ. In Psalms uh, 133, verse one, how good and pleasant. It is when God's people live together in unity. So right there is saying, I mean, how great is it when we come together and worship together, we have the same beliefs. You know, we're basically, we're, uh, we're bringing together the body of the Christ and uh, showing our glory to God again. So my final topic, my final point is uh, it creates an uh, atmosphere for a vibrant and meaningful worship. So in Psalms 95, verses 1, through, uh, 1 and 2, it says, uh, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and uh, exult to him with music and song. And in verses 6 and 7, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So, uh, right there from Scripture again, uh, it's just showing us that uh, coming together uh, in church uh, just creates a great atmosphere here for our worship, and and uh, it's just a great thing. So that's my message today. Thank you. So as you're speaking about worship, Philip, that was great. Our next song is actually all about worship. That we're here to worship God through our songs and through our praises, um, that our hearts are open um, to God, and that this time especially is a time during the week that we dedicate to opening our hearts completely to God and being restored and renewed. So if you want to stand with us, we'll worship. Um, our next song is here for you.
song today called All the Poor and Powerless, and I want to read a verse um, before we sing this song that I thought uh, I've been reading in <clears throat> the Old Testament, which is actually, everyone says Old Testament is hard to read, but it has a lot of great <clears throat> gold nuggets that you can find, um, but I was reading in Second Chronicles 20, and it's a story about King Jehoshaphat, and there's all these countries <clears throat> coming against him in war, and um, they have no option but to turn to God or um, just turn to sadness and sorrow. So he says, um, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. O our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And I think that really reflects all of our hearts many times. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on God. Um, and uh, the, as we sing this new song together, um, all the poor and powerless and all the lost and lonely, all the thieves will come confess and know that you are holy. Um, and as we sing it together, um, I pray that you're thinking your own heart. Um, well, um, and just surrender to God and realize that he's the one who knows what to do and we just need to keep our eyes on him and he will fight the battle for us.
Now we'll have the main sermon from uh, Dr. Song. Before I start, I just want to tell uh, Philip that was a great message, uh, Philip, and I want to tell you that you love the church and the church loves you. So we, uh, it's admirable. You, you just touched my heart this morning and uh, very thorough and very deep. And, and Jane, uh, thank you for the sharing too. And uh, remember, your dad loves you, so uh, it's, it shows. And uh, Sammy, you reassured me this morning by reading that passage that your eyesight is 2020, <laughs> because I wasn't able to see it, they kind of, uh, so that's good. It was a good eye test. That's what we do in ophthalmology. Um, so let's, let's read together uh, this morning. I, I want to talk about the subject I, um, when, when Ted spoke, touched my heart about anxiety and uh, actually talked about worries. Uh, and I want to read a passage with you on a similar uh, subject on, uh, that would relate to freedom from fear, how to have freedom from fear. And uh, it's, I'm starting from Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 1 to 12. Um, I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to start uh, 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 from verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak to his disciples, saying, 
be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, and uh, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. Then he goes on, and this is where we see the kind of uh, the points to, uh, that would help us to free us from fear. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid though of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should be afraid of. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man, as the Son of Man, the Son of Man will acknowledge him before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. So the passage is, is very clear, and he speaks, the Lord speaks before uh, what it says here, thousands of people. Actually, in the other translation, it's up 10,000 of people were gathering there, and among them were the Pharisees. And remember, the Pharisees were the uh, extreme uh, uh, fanatics, religious fanatics, who practiced terror, basically. The people who disagreed with them, they called them as blasphemers and killed them. And this is what we see today, especially part uh, in the Middle East and now what's happening. If people would have very little religious intolerance and those who disagree with them uh, would, would kill them. They were religious terrorists at the end of the day, if you want to describe them. They were the people who were behind, you know, behind in a major way um, uh, to go after Christ and say, crucify him, crucify him because basically he did not fit onto, into their model. But there is a bigger, bigger calling here in this passage to something we all, uh, we all uh, deal with, uh, possibly on a daily basis. If you look at the world around you, we are sort of hit by a, by a hurricane of fear, of terror. Actually, terrorism is in the headline news. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, I, was, I was sharing a few weeks ago uh, that the, uh, one of the great presidents of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, um, during his early reign and after his first term, he actually, when he was running for the second term, he made that declaration that I, I promise the people of the United States four things, four freedoms. He said freedom of expression, freedom of uh, religion, or that is freedom of worship, which, which we, we thankfully have now to a certain extent in the U.S. Three is freedom from want. He became a little bit kind of full of himself there because who can give you anything that you want? Uh, but then fourth, which is very ambitious and no person can do it, is freedom from fear. And it came in the annals of history that he promised the people of the United States freedom from fear. And soon after, during this time period, the Great Depression came. I'm talking about the Great Economic Depression. And people were, were surmounted, were captured by fear, economic fear of what the future would hold. And later, that kind of a, soon after came the Second World War. And he was president, and, and, and there was tremendous fear from Japan and from Germany and from the Axis, and people were, were mesmerized with fear until he died. He died, actually, right before the end of the war, and they still the war was not over, particularly with Japan, and Harry Truman took over. But then fear continued, because after the Second World War and the United States was triumphant, and they thought we got rid of the axis now of Germany, Nazi Germany and the J Japan, uh, everybody thought now is a bright new day. But then came what was called the Cold War and the Soviet Union and communism. 
And so there was fear for almost 30 years or more, actually 40 years or more, of, of, of a nuclear war. The enemy had nuclear weapons. And then when they, in 89, when there was the kind of break of the wall of Berlin, and there was a great optimism that now it's over. Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, and now it's over. Now we're free, ultimately free from fear. And then came the era of terrorism. The era of terrorism, the small wars, from uh, starting from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and all of the wars, and, and uh, the, the, there is no rest. There is no tranquility, and there is no freedom from fear. Because there can be no freedom from fear except through the Prince of Peace, through the Lord himself. And this is what he does here. This great physician is giving you a prescription for how to be, to be free from fear. The first thing that he gives you is, is the kind of perspective on death and eternity. He said, look, I mean, and he's talking to, these, to his disciples. Because these disciples, remember, they're sort of sitting among, among them, the Pharisees who came in to threaten them and intimidate them and tell them, we can kill you all if you follow this man. He said, do not be afraid of them, these terrorists. Do not be afraid of anything that would cause you death. Why? Because death has no power over you anymore. If you have the gift of eternal life, you have overcome death. And death now is a gain, as Paul says. For me, it's to live with Christ, and death is gain. You see, you see the, the main thing is that the kind of people would threaten you, or the enemy Satan would threaten you that you will die. We, we're afraid of things. Well, we're afraid of disease. We're afraid of uh, terrorism. We're afraid of things because we might die. But for the true believer, if you have the gift of eternal life, death is no worry because you have the gift of eternal life. You see, you see the whole, this puts you in a whole big perspective. You see, when they, when they put you, and, and then the Lord Jesus Christ would describe death as sleep, as, as be just going into sleep for a little while. This is what becomes for the believer. When he went in to the kind of daughter of uh, Jairus, and, and they told him that she's dead, she told him, no, she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. But in reality, this is what happens to the believers. They go into temporary sleep, that is, they sleep, and then they're with the Lord. And they're waiting for the day of the resurrection, but they're in the presence of the Lord. So do not let anybody that intimidate you, particularly Satan, and say, you'll die. There is no problem for death, because you have overcome death. And physical death is only now, is only a bridge to being with the Lord. See, see, this is the whole perspective, for it says, I am, he says, I am the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die. He says, he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I've written these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. So I might pray with all my heart that you will not leave this room without having the assurance that you have eternal life. And how can you acquire this eternal life? You come to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for the past. Cleanse my heart. I want you to reign on my heart and be my Savior and my Lord. You will have the gift of eternal life. I love this kind of analogy of being put to sleep when you die because when, when we take people to the operating room and we give them anesthesia and, they, and if you, they recognize the fact that this is just temporary, and that they're going to have a surgery which is going to make them feel better and have a better life later on. And when they open their eyes, they open their eyes and say, was it successful? I said, it was perfect. And this is exactly what happens to the believer. You go through this thing of temporary sleep and then you're with the Lord. And there is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. Voltaire, which is who's the great poet in the 18th century, he was such a... Uh, such an atheist who attacked the Bible and attacked the Word of God and said there is nothing called heaven or hell and there is all, all of this is just a kind of a uh, fallacy. All of this is a man-made story. And he said, I'm going to write a book, and which he did, he wrote several books, to kind of show the fallacy of the Christian religion and of the Bible. And I'm going to claim that in 100 years, Christianity will be over after this book. Well, he died, and in 50 years after his death, he soon died. In 50 years after his death, his house became a place where the Geneva Bible Society was printing Bibles and spreading them all over the world. 
And it's amazing how, but the, the, the thing that, but it's to point here, that at his deathbed, he was crying out and saying, I see hell. Can somebody help me? I'll give all my possessions if somebody can give me six more months to live. See, hell is real. It's the eternal separation from God. And eternal life is real. And you will, <laughs> the tragedy is when you discover this reality after it's too late. After it's too late. And I'm, I'm very fond of, um, of Francis Collins. Uh, many of you wrote the book, Language, uh, Language of God, about the DNA. He's a great guy, and I, 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 I think very highly of him. I had the pleasure of meeting him recently, but he's such a modest person. But he says that he grew up in a, in a house. His dad was a professor at Yale. And they basically were, you know, basically atheists. They didn't believe that there was a god or heaven or hell. They didn't believe in any religion. And he, he went into med school. He went first and did PhD in quantum physics. The guy was smart and still is. And after doing PhD in quantum physics, he got bored with all these kind of formulas. So he went into med school and was accepted with basically flying, flying colors, went into pediatrics, and then wanted to, to, to do ped, ped, me, uh, ped uh, medicine, pediatric medicine and sort of did a combination. And then, and then was kind of went into genomic medicine uh, as part of research, but he was sort of an empty shell. He said until he met a woman on the wards he was taking care of, part of his internal medicine rotation, who was dying, and she had a heart problem. But she had this great peace. And she asked him about whether he has peace about death. And he said, all what I've studied from quantum physics to genomic medicine could not explain why this woman had peace. She had the gift of eternal life. She had the blessed assurance that she belonged to Christ. And soon after, he came to know Christ, and his life changed. And this is the gift that the Lord wants to give you this morning. This is the gift of eternal life that he, he wants you to kind of have. But the second ingredient, this, the first thing is, is death and eternity, but the second, second important thing is your value and sanctity. You're, you're, you're very important to the Lord. You're very special to the Lord. And let me give you some example here, what, he, what the Lord is trying to say. He said, look, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And then in verse 5, he says, uh, in verse 6, he says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. You see, these kind of sparrows are very small birds. And these small birds, they used to sell every two for, uh, for a penny. So they, pay, they sell every two, every two for a penny. When, they sell, when you get two couple of these birds, that is, you get four birds, you pay them two penny, and they give you one for free. He said, this fifth one, which is for free, that in the eyes of men and women has no value, is of great value to the Lord. But aren't you more precious than these, these, this sparrow? Aren't you more precious than these words? Look what he says in Matthew 6.26. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store any in barns. That is, they, don't, they put no effort to take care of themselves. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them, than they? So look, let me, let me tell you this. When you accept the gift of eternal life, when you accept Christ as a personal Savior and Lord, and you're determined to be his disciple, you also become his child. And if the Lord takes care of the, of the birds, he takes care of the sparrows, he took, took care of the uh, whatever, that he, he cares, cares more for you because you are his child. Aren't you much more valuable? than they. And this is what the Lord is reminding me today. It's interesting that Nathan Johnson describes this dialogue. He says, he made sort of a, a poem of two birds talking to each other. And he looks at these, all these people going to work and they're worried and they're sort of a, all on the fast lane. And he says, what's wrong with them? He looks at people that they come, how they come to church and go out of church. He said, what's wrong with them? Because he said, the other guy, the other bird answers. He says, they don't realize that they have a father who cares for them. 
This is why they're so worried. This is why they sort of, they're all in turmoil. I love the, the verse that it says in Romans 8, 35, 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Who shall separate us from the love of God, it says. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything in the all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So nothing can separate you from the love of God. Once you enter into that circle of his eternal love by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of this, you have, a, you have to realize that your value and sanctity will give you a special position that the Lord will never give up on you and never give up on you. And this is, this is something, what the blessed assurance that we have that would give us a deep sense of security. And this is why we should not allow fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect, perfect love, his love towards us, which is perfect. And, and our love towards him, perfect love drives out fear. The one fear who fears is not made in perfect love. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So to this morning, may the Lord perfect you in love. May the Lord give you that heart that truly loves the Lord and experiences full love and say, Lord, I want to live for you. I want to love you. I want to experience your eternal love. I love the story of uh, Lillian Thrasher. Lillian Thrasher from Egypt, and I don't know if anybody heard about her here, but Lillian Thrasher went as a ve at a very young age. She was 19 years old. She went to Egypt to serve there, and she was wanted to kind of preach the gospel and share of Christ, but then the Lord led her to start adopting children. And she had no resources, no support. She started the ministry just by faith. And she was in a way like George Muller, and she started adopting, she started adopting a basically newborn kid where her mother, where her mother died right there, and she got that kid, and her name was Farida. But then she got a little boy, three years old. Again, his parents were, were not there. She took him, took him to, his, to her house. His name was Habib, which means beloved. So Habib, her, her child finally got the plague. This was, we're talking about almost 100 years ago. This was around 1913. So he got the plague. And they told her, you throw him away. He's going to infect you and infect the whole people. He has the plague. And we have, at that point, they had no treatment for it. Can you imagine the plague? Brother and sister, plague is much worse than Ebola. And in, they, they just told her, get rid of this boy. She said, no. She said, the Lord never got rid of me in most difficult times. There is nothing that will separate me from the love of Christ, and there is nothing that will separate this boy from the love of Christ that is in me. And never gave up on that boy. Finally, she got the plague, and the Lord healed both of them. But she stayed with him in the quarantine. So this is the kind of love that you, the Lord has, would like to kind of bestow on you and surround you with. Three, providence and security. Providence and security. I love, like this verse. And it says here, verse 7, Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You, do not be afraid. Your very hair is numbered. Now, I love this because the audience here, all of you have a lot of hair. There's nobody. So you have a lot of hair. And it's an average is that we lose almost 100 hair uh, uh, per day. You lose every, every day, but it says in the word of God that not even one of them you lose without the permission of your father. That in everything that's happening in your life is under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. Things are under control. Even when you think, oh, things are totally out of control, they are under the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is an element of providence and security. So don't panic. When things go wrong, don't panic. He knows that this is going to happen. And he will provide for you, and he will bless you, and he will make sure that things will all change and turn around for the good of those who love the Lord and are walking according to his plan. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The presence of God is with us. I, 
This is a great verse to have, Isaiah 43, 1, which says, do not be afraid because I've redeemed, redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. See, I taught you Arabic here. <clears throat> so keep reading it in Arabic now. So this is the kind of uh, promises that the Lord has. It's the things that you are so much concerned about that overwhelm you with fear and say, what would happen? Would this thing happen? Put it in the hand of the Lord and just sleep well at night and rest during the day because he carries, he carries you up. John Kennedy, when he came here to Dallas-Fort Worth area, <clears throat> he had all the kind of a, all the policemen, you see the, these videos, when he came in before he right his assassination, all the protection that any president could have. They were surrounding him from all sides. But he wasn't able to protect himself. Neither the U.S. government was able to protect him. Sadat, when he was standing on the 6th of October, 1981, and parading his troops, they told him, put a bulletproof jacket, Mr. President. He said, I don't need it. These are my troops. They will protect me, and I'm parading them. And actually, one of the lieutenants in his troops was the one who killed him and shot him from almost a distance of a half a mile, of a quarter of a mile. Can you imagine that we try to protect ourselves, but the Lord is your protection? Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And it says here, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Memorize that one in Isaiah 41. Finally, number four, <clears throat> we're not afraid because the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. His presence with us, but there is a special power through the third person of the Lord, who is the Holy Spirit, who is with us. It says, for the Holy Spirit, when they intimidate you and when they take you now to courts and when people would tell you, you have to be silent, be quiet, don't speak about Christ. He said, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. In other words, there is always a measure of the power of the Holy Spirit which comes to you in the midst of ad adversity. And you have a power, an extraordinary pow power. Turn your eyes to Christ and say, Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit so that in this terrible situation I find myself in, I want to be your witness. I want to declare you. Whether it's a problem or a disaster, I want to declare your peace. I want to declare your presence. I want to declare that I belong to you. And the particular thing that is sent to us today, the message sent to us, is that we, this power comes once we want to be his witnesses, once we want to declare him. Now, I want to talk to you here as young people. It says here that if you are, uh, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge him before the angels of God. And he's asking us clearly that we shall receive power when the Holy Spirit will fall on us, will come on us, and we shall be his witnesses. And I want to call on you as, 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 as the members of this Agape Church. Prepare yourselves to be his disciples and witnesses. You are his ministers. Don't just be here in this place as attendees. I'm glad that you love the church and love the fellowship, but don't just develop an elite group which you speak to one another but prepare yourself because this is when the power of the Lord will come on you be an army that moves out I'm going to propose to you at the end of this service that you will commit and I want still we want that have meeting to take place Josh and I don't know if we want to do something after this service or something that we will come together and you commit to have one Sunday which you call it a outreach Sunday and each one of you will get in touch at least with one or two people and invite them to come here and ask the person, find out who's speaking on that Sunday, and ask them to kind of give a message which is outreach message. You should be winners. You should bring your friends to know Christ because then when you become a witness, there is an extraordinary power, power of the Holy Spirit that will come on you. It says beautifully in Revelation 12, 11, they triumphed, that is the disciples, triumphed over him, that is over Satan, by the blood of the lamp and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. 
So I want to ask you this morning that you, the Lord would transform you, would dispel fear, and particularly the fear of witnessing for Christ. You see, when you go out to the world, you, 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 many times you think that you're in the United States of America, but this is a different country from what used, used to be 100 years ago. When the minute when you start speaking about Christ and your experience of Christ, all of a sudden you find people looking at you like he or she went nuts, you know. But do not be afraid. These people around you, out of love, driven out of love, share with them the word of Christ lovingly and kindly. It says here, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Don't argue with them, but just love them and share with them, even in little doses, what you have, what the Lord has done in your life. And bring people to the knowledge of Christ. At that point, a great power will overshadow your life, will, 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 will really prevail in your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this great assurance that no matter what comes, disease, death, or terror, we have the gift of eternal life. And I pray with all my heart that every single person here have experienced the true birth of the Spirit. Cleanse our hearts once again, O Lord, and control us and fill them with the Holy Spirit and let us live a life that would dispel fear because perfect love dispels fear. And let us be reminded this morning of our value and sanctity before you and be reminded of your providence and security but above all, that we are your witnesses who should testify despite adversity. We pray with all our hearts that, that you transform us all together to be your witnesses, to declare your light in a dark world. We commit ourselves to you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We will continue worship with offering. If I could have Ryan and Ted help, please. It's me. 